Welcome back everyone, my name is Kevin, I put the Samsung Galaxy A14 through its paces for two weeks now. This new affordable budget smartphone from Samsung has an improved 90Hz display, a 5000mAh battery, up to 8GB of RAM, and an octa-core processor. It can handle graphically demanding games at a high frame rate. There's a 50 megapixel main camera, two biometric methods for unlocking, and we still get the headphone jack, as well as the micro SD card reader. I've now used it for long enough to confidently bring you my A14 full review. Everything from the battery life, the cameras, the gaming, and the day-to-day -day performance will be addressed and explained now. To start, we get a new design on the A14 with a striped textured finish for added grip. The sides are less curved than the A13, and the new phone is slightly thicker. There are three cameras on the back of this phone. This is the main lens, there is a depth sensing camera, as well as a macro lens. The display bezels are quite large, but the screen is nevertheless a standout feature of this phone because of the pixel density and the refresh rate. The bump up to 400 pixels per inch makes this sharper than the lowest end current iPhone, and all of the affordable phones I've seen that are comparable or in this price bracket. The color vibrancy of Samsung Galaxy A series phones have always been pleasing in my opinion. They've built on that and made this slightly more color accurate. The panel is 6.6 .6 inches at a resolution of 2408 by 1080. The aspect ratio is 20 by 9 and I've always liked that for watching YouTube videos and movies in landscape. Viewing angles on this display are also very nice. Gaming on the A14 is a real highlight because of the display, and we'll get into the gaming performance in a bit. It used to be the case, if you wanted a phone in this price point, with this quality of display, you'd have to buy an older flagship device or an older mid-range phone on a discount. Now Samsung has upped the bar in terms of budget phone display pixel density. I've tried using multiple different carriers on my unlocked A14 5G, and my call quality as well as my data reception have been good for a device in this price bracket. It's not getting speeds that are as fast as current generation Samsung mid-series phones in terms of the data, but I am content with the speeds. The biometrics available for unlocking the phone are quite straightforward. We have the option to use the fingerprint scanner, which is found on the power button of the phone, as well as using the front camera to take an image scan for authentication. This seems to use the same sensor as what was found in the Galaxy A13. That's quite all right, because once you get used to it, the sensor is accurate and fast. It will allow you to register up to three fingers. Of course, there's pin, pattern, and passcode. If you do not choose to use the biometrics, that is optional. Something puzzled me upon the first boot up. The device gave me prompts to insert a SIM card to get through the setup process. Now, a customer service representative may tell you that a SIM card is required, but as your personal tech advisor, I'm here to tell you that is not true. All you have to do is press the corners of the screen a few times, then press down on the volume button. I've done this step on my phone already, two weeks ago to be exact, but you will see a pop-up on your phone say that it has been unlocked and you can proceed without a SIM card. I know some friends who already own a flagship device and still want to buy this phone as a secondary device as a backup with no SIM card, so I hope this trick to bypass the not-so-magical setup wizard is helpful for you. While I was setting up my phone, I changed the home screen grid size to 5x5 as I usually do, and in the navigation bar settings, I switched from the old school buttons to the modern swipe gestures. This phone has NFC, so I went ahead and added my bank card to Google Pay for tapping my phone at payment terminals. Moving apps to a micro SD card on the A14 is simple. In the apps menu, select the app you want to transfer and change the storage location to the SD card. If the app you're trying to move does not have that option, try enabling developer options and in that menu, select force allow apps on external. I hope that helps. I paid a bit extra to get my unit shipped early here in Canada. Now the retail price of this phone is under $200 in the States. Do let me know where in the world you are so I can help you out by putting a link in the description. Taking a look at the box of the Galaxy A14, you may already recognize what is missing by the size of it. We get the standard manual paperwork, a SIM card tool, and the USB-C to C cable, but that's it. No wall adapter for the second year in a row, and I am not happy with this because I do not have a spare USB-C adapter. I would be less displeased with the omission of an essential accessory if they passed down more cost savings to us. Now that we have that disappointment of packaging out of the way, let's talk about the A14 battery life. This 5000 mAh battery lasts me an average of 8.5 hours of screen time or a day and a half after charging. Getting two full days with light use is quite possible. My average use case is a couple hours of watching YouTube on high brightness, about an hour of gaming, listening to music in the background, taking a few calls, snapping photos, browsing social media, all while Wi-Fi and cellular connectivity are turned on. I'm also checking emails and browsing Chrome throughout the day. I do not use Bluetooth very often as I have wired earbuds, 
and the display is in adaptive mode, switching between 60Hz and 90 I think you can safely expect between 7.5 hours to 9 hours of battery life on a single charge if you're a moderate user like me. I think it's interesting how the Galaxy A14, the budget phone, has a bigger battery capacity than the Galaxy S23 and the S23 Plus. From all the way empty 0% to 100% fully charged, it takes 2 hours and 17 minutes. The A14 charges up at 15 watts in case you're wondering, and no, it does not support wireless charging. Another note to add about the A14 battery is that although it's sealed and not interchangeable like older Samsung phones from years ago, Samsung has not used an excessive amount of adhesive inside of the phone. Long down the road, if you choose to, you can replace that battery yourself without too much struggle. This in combination with the fact that Samsung is delivering many years of security updates makes this, in my opinion, the most future-proof budget phone out on the market currently. Out of the box, this came with Android 13 and One UI Core version 5.0. We're supposed to get software support on this phone up to Android 15. If you want to prolong the life of your device, you can go into the battery settings, under more battery settings, and toggle the option to protect battery. This will limit the maximum charge capacity with the goal of preventing battery degradation. Obviously, you'll have less screen time, but the battery will be in better shape in the future. I have the 64GB storage variant with 4GB of RAM. This is the A14 5G model that I bought unlocked. I also have a locked version to T-Mobile, which I had imported into Canada. I really wanted to make sure I was the first person in my country to get this phone. With 4 gigs of RAM on this, I did not see any major problems. Switching between tasks could certainly be smoother if you opt for the 6 or 8 gigabyte RAM variant, and if you have the 4 gig model like me, it can be helpful to keep around the optimization device care widget on one of your home screens. Overall, I'm not complaining about the multitasking capability of the A14 for the price. The speed of that RAM does not seem to be improved coming from the A13, by the way, in case you were curious. For the mobile gamers, the benchmark score fanatics, and the tech enthusiasts, this next part is for you. Although the A14's chipset is not new to me, I enjoyed the gaming experience on this phone. PUBG plays at 90 frames per second on HD graphics, and the gameplay is as smooth as you'd expect 90Hz to be. There are no frame drops, and I can confidently approve this phone for PUBG gamers. Minecraft also plays at 90Hz very well. This game isn't exactly my forte, but I have absolutely nothing negative to say about the performance of Minecraft here. Same can be said about World of Tanks playing at 90Hz. I'm impressed. Old school RuneScape is less graphically demanding. It too runs 90 frames per second, and I got many hours of gameplay in this title. Orbia, Evoland, Terraria, and Asphalt 9 are some other games I tested, and I think gameplay was very enjoyable in every session. Call of Duty Mobile is allowing for medium graphics at high frame rate, although it is actually limited to 60 frames per second on the A14. I went into developer options and enabled show frame rate so you can see what I'm talking about. The COD Mobile gameplay is very smooth at 60 hertz, no frame drops, I'm able to play competitively and get my usual score in every match lobby, which is first place. The chipset in this phone is from MediaTek, the Dimensity 700, yes, the same 7 nanometer chip that was found in the Galaxy A13 5G. This is going to make the comparison between these two phones even more interesting. I am disappointed by the fact that on paper, the processor, battery, biometric methods, and even the cameras are the same as the phone from last year. The benchmarks, however, paint a very different picture than the spec sheet. The A14 scored higher in both single-core and multi-core in Geekbench 5. The multi-core score is quite a bit higher, in fact. This warrants more testing in the future between this and the predecessor. In day-to-day -day performance, this phone did not fail me. To this day, I have not encountered any app crashing, and the only slowdown or lag would be occurring when I'm switching apps. It takes a second to initialize a background task. Again, this aspect of the phone is not disappointing to me given the price point of the 4GB RAM variant I bought. Time for the cameras. This is an area where on the spec sheet we're seeing a copy and paste of the predecessor. Tomorrow's video will conclude whether or not the phones are using the same camera modules. As for now, let's talk about the configuration of the A14 camera. There's three lenses on the back. The main 50 megapixel lens is the middle one. This is a two megapixel macro camera and the top lens is for depth tracking to get better focus to create portrait blur effect. This year, Samsung has improved the image processing so that colors and subject backgrounds look more natural and true to life. The color range and detail is not lacking, and I can confidently use this main camera to post pictures on social media. Based on the audience reception on that shorts video I'm putting out tomorrow, I will go ahead and make full length comparisons with speed tests and specification breakdowns for overall performance compared to other devices too. 
On the A14, sharpness is yet again a highlight for a budget phone. In the settings, you can enable Pro Mode to manually adjust ISO and white balance. This is actually very useful at times. There is also night mode and food mode which is here for varying your photography style when showing off your meals. In terms of video recording, the A14 is capable of doing 1080p at 30 frames per second. It is not impressive, but it gets the job done. Video stabilization has got to be the worst aspect of this phone's camera. I've seen this macro lens in far too many phones now, but here it is yet again for you to judge. The front selfie camera is now 13 megapixels at an f2.0 aperture, and on paper that is a big upgrade in the lineup, so you can be the judge of the selfie camera. Let me know if you approve of this A14 selfie. This 13 megapixel lens is also capable of 1080p video at 30 frames per second, and this should give you an idea of what video calling will look like. There are two big cons that I have to mention about this phone, the first of which is the fact that it only has one SIM card slot. This might not be a big deal to you, but for us international travelers, this is disappointing. Secondly, the A14 is a single loudspeaker, and it gets loud, but the audio quality is not up to par with my expectations. In fact, to my ears, it is worse than the phone is succeeding. The A13 sounds clearer, and that's to say, less tinny than the A14. Regardless, I would not wish audio quality this bad upon my worst enemies. Aside from that, the Galaxy A14 is everything you'd want it to be. The gaming performance is impressive for a budget phone, the photos that come out of it are quite usable for social media, and these days I commend Samsung for keeping the fan favorite features like the headphone jack and micro SD card slot because not all of us can afford high end accessories and we can't always access cloud storage. So when this phone has been out in the market for a while, you're going to see the 6GB and 8GB RAM variants come down in price a little bit, and I think that would make the higher RAM variants a really good deal. Now as for now, the base model of the A14 gives you everything you'd expect except for good quality speakers. You may believe I was too harsh on the speakers of this phone, but these are just my honest experiences, and if you do have a Samsung Galaxy device, regardless of what model, do tell me what you think about the speaker quality. Before you pick up the A14 or recommend it to someone, you're going to want to see that head-to-head -head comparison between this and other offerings to get an even better picture of where this stands in the phone market. I'm buying these phones with my own money to bring you a fair and honest review of the device. If you appreciate that, let me know by leaving a like on the video. And as always, my friends, I will keep up to date with you in the comments. Any questions you might have, I'll see you soon.